well first Holmes was born Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Sup Holmes Thanks for being on my live stream show, chat It's a chat show, not a talk show, it's a chat show Because we talk too much for it to be a talk show Chats and uh, this week, I have Adam Saltzman on the show. Say hi to everybody, Adam, if you want. Hey, everybody. Uh, how are you doing? Um, yeah, I wonder how they are doing. We'll find out later. Adam, how are you doing? Your big game just came out on Friday. That's got to be weird. Yes, it's a little, it's a little strange. It's a, a definite uh, change in uh, uh, lifestyle. I'm, I'm sleeping at night again, so that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, to let people know, you are a video game developer. You've developed a lot of games that uh, have garnered a very passionate following in the past, such as Cannonball and Gravity Hook. And mm -hmm. just recently, you were sanctioned by the by the man to make <laughs> straight up, straight up, <laughs> by a game based on the Hunger Games, which is uh, something people simply cannot stop talking about. So you've gone from making Cannibal to a game based on the biggest movie probably of the year. So what it's, was that like? Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, a little weird, a little weird. Um, like in a way it was, it was, it was like weirdly normal. Like I don't have a perspective anymore on how big a deal the movie is or anything. Like it's completely, so I've just kind of been head down making a game. And I used to do this before I was like full indie. Um, mm -hmm. Like my, one of my, the way that I like helped pay the bills was doing contract work and freelance work, specifically designing games to help promote other things and trying to do a good job of it. So huh. I did that for a few years before I started making things like Cannonball. So oh, okay. in a way it was sort of like, oh, it's back to the old, <laughs> it's the usual, but um, on, definitely on a different, I guess, level of visibility. Oh, sure. Yeah, it doesn't get much more visible other than like if it was Star Wars or The Matrix or Harry uh, <laughs> right. Potter or something. This is as huge as it gets. So, so how did you go about tackling that? Were you into The Hunger Games before? Did you have an idea? I, that was the only reason I took the job, actually, is um, my wife reads a lot of young adult fiction. So like that bookshelf at Barnes & Noble that everybody jokes about that says like, what is it? Paranormal teen romance? Like that's... <laughs> sure. That's my wife's bookshelf, basically. Um, and uh, she reads, reads lots of other things, too. But she read these because everybody was talking about them in that scene or that community. And she was like, these are, these are really cool. There's, like, mm. there's a little bit of murder going on. And there's a bunch of other stuff. But mostly they're just they're a really entertaining read. And so I was like, well, all right, I'll give them a shot. And uh, I read the first book, I think, in one night. Oh, wow. Um, I uh, read the second book like the next night. They're really, um, they're really entertaining books. So the idea of getting to make a game, I don't know, I, I kind of think every, maybe not everybody wants to do it, but I think a lot of people would absolutely jump at the chance to get to try and adapt something that they love from one medium into, you know, the medium that we happen to work in. Sure, sure, sure. Actually, and how did you, whoa, I'm sorry, like, go ahead. It, well, it was like, it was kind of like, if I don't make the Hunger Games game, somebody else is going to, and it might not be awesome, and that would suck. Like, what a cool missed opportunity. Yeah. Um, that absolutely. probably sounds like really conceited or something, but... Um, no, I, I, know that, I know how you feel. You had a vision, it sounds like, right off the bat from reading the books of what you thought a game should and shouldn't be based on well, this property be, that you enjoyed. Like a billion different things. The books are... Um, there's a lot of sort of weird political posturing in the books, and there's a lot of kind of... Uh, uh, obviously action in the books and there's a lot sure. of um, sort of kind of interesting interpersonal relationships in the books and all of those things seemed like really good fodder for making an interesting game but um, we only got to kind of we focused on like one really narrow slice of that yeah and and why was that that you focused on to me it's the the, the game that you made it focuses on the feeling that Katniss has of constant danger and constant need to to uh 
to live up to the expectations of others. Maybe I'm reading it into it too. No, 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 I think, I think that's, I, I mean, I hope some of that's there. That's awesome. Um, uh, I mean, the idea was like, we can only make a small game. So if we're going to make a game about something, you know, it probably makes sense for it to be about the main character. Uh, and if it's going to be about the main character, then to me, it kind of has to be about sort of her bow and arrow. Because mm. that's her, that's her action thing that she has. Um, that would translate into an action game, and, and part of the goal of it was was to make an action game. So those pieces kind of just like, if we have to do a bow and arrow game, we let's, we better just come up with something good, uh, and and we happen to. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's uh, I love how you didn't skimp on the difficulty either. I died so many times uh, in the beginning, and I couldn't blame it on anything but myself because the controls are spot yeah. on. But tell me about the bees. Tell me about uh, those bees. What? So those are those are not as large as that in the actual story. Um, they're pretty much normal sized bees in the story. Um, yeah. And because of that, we had actually we actually proposed a different. Um, the thing was, we wanted to do a bow and arrow game. That meant, you know, for it to be accessible, probably tapping on targets to shoot them. Uh, sure. So we didn't want to make Angry Birds again. Um, so we weren't going to slingshot stuff. So it had to be tapped to shoot. And if it's going to be tapped to shoot, then you need targets that are about the size of your finger to shoot. Right. And so if Cannibal, um, um, unless Katniss is going to be a reasonable size, you know, if you want her to be small on the screen, then the targets are going to have to be about the same size as her. So we'd actually designed these sort of uh, robot drone things that would fly around. And they were, um, they were based very closely on um, concepts for machinery and technology from the film. Oh really? Huh. But um, and they were they were really only designed purely for gameplay. It's like these are things that could be the size of a finger, and that, that was the whole thought process. But um, the author actually uh, preferred that we use something that existed in the story, even if we had to exaggerate it. Huh. So, um, so it's still true. Um, and for bees. for all we know, there are giant bees in the Hunger Games. Um, there kind of there kind of could be because there's actually some there's some kind of messed up animals in the story. Um, yeah, there's there's more to it than a lot of people know. I think people who haven't seen it or read the books yet look at it and think, oh, it's like that Japanese movie Battle Royale, or it's like a, you know, just kind of a gladiators. Yeah, um, there's. I think people are really, uh, really happy to be able to just like put it in a bucket, and it actually kind of bothers me. I think um, this might be a little bit tangential, but it, oh, I, it, to me, it, it sometimes <laughs> it sometimes feels like um, because a lot of the the fan base and the audience for the books uh, is young women, that that mm -hmm. somehow, it, it almost sometimes feels like that's what counts against it. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, does that yeah, make I sense? I don't know if that sounds oh, absolutely. Or not, but... Well, you've got teenage guys, and they so badly don't want to be teenage girls for some reason. <laughs> exactly. No, I've exactly. always tried to figure out why that is, because they like <laughs> teenage girls, but yeah. they don't want to be teenage girls. and. Yep. Uh, that's a problem. I actually, I wanted to ask you why you think The Hunger Games is such a big deal. I have a theory, but uh, since this is a show where I talk to people who are nice enough to come on, I don't want to just talk the whole time. So, do you have, <laughs> I mean, do you have well, a thought about it? Why do you think it's such a big deal? Um, I, I have a couple of theories, but they're, they're based on my taste, which definitely is weirder and different from a lot of other people's. But for me, like, it's a it's a story that has consequences, but mm. is accessible still. So you don't always have accessible storytelling, where choices that characters make in the story actually matter in the long run. Okay. And there are choices that characters make in the Hunger Games that are like a big deal. And so if you're into like hardcore serial fiction in graphic novel form or like weird TV show form, mm -hmm. like that's not a weird thing. Like we're used to that. Like Battlestar Galactica is just that forever and that's what I, I don't care the Battlestar like the spaceships in it like what I care is like somebody decides to do something that matters they don't flip flop on it the next episode um, right and these books felt like that a lot to me like yeah there's like teenage pageantry and like love triangles and things but the decisions that are made are not trivial decisions they're kind of mm -hmm. life and death decisions that have these huge consequences and sure. that to me is that's awesome storytelling period. And I think, I think, I don't think, I don't think anybody reads the Hunger Games and goes, finally, some consequences. 
but uh, I think that's one thing that's gripping. Like if the if the author follows through on the promise of like, you know, this is for real, uh, mm -hmm. that's really compelling. And I think yeah. there's another thing going on, which is um, the author saves the violence for later. Mm -hmm. So like a normal, the normal way you would do an action story is you would start out you know, like a Mission Impossible movie opening where like 40 people die and there's at least 30 explosions in a two minute span to really get people like, wow, you know, and Hunger Games almost starts out more like a grim fairy tale or something. It's just sort of like, like orphans in the woods kind of a setting. And, sure. and so you, um, it reminds me of the orphanage a little bit, the Spanish horror movie. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> it's it's a total bummer, but they did kind of the same thing where it's it's an author using one kind of story to um, make connections between you and the characters in the story, and then changing it up. Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah, something that point. I think is super effective. So she has this kind of like teen love triangle thing, and you're sort of like, oh whoa, I'm like I'm inside her head. I understand what the different characters feel, and then it's like, oh my god, they're all gonna die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, the, the the sort of like there. we're gonna use we're gonna use kind of horror movie cliches to kind of get you to be worried about the main character, you know, surviving the story. But then you know we're gonna twist it and turn it back into a family drama. Kind of right, so, right, right, so right. Really right. Like and they're both drama. stronger for it. Yeah, and I don't think anybody is reacting to that stuff consciously when they read and enjoy the books. And maybe they're just with all these things. There's like a right. The right thing at the right time, you know. Cannibal was that. If I didn't, if Cannibal didn't come out when I made it, somebody was gonna make a catchy auto runner within the next year. Ah, like without yeah, it, it, was just, it was just in the public consciousness. I think. I think you're selling yourself short, as you might expect. I, mean, I think I think it turned out really cool. I'm sure. Sure. Uh, I don't there's think more to it than that. Like what you just said about Hunger Games actually reminds me of Cannibal because Cannibal is accessible. It's simple to pick up, but your choices, your moment-to-moment -moment choices, have instant consequence. Either yeah, you yeah. jump through a, a window and pull off this incredible action move, or you're instantly dead. But you're not <laughs> yeah, so yeah. badly punished. It's a serious consequence because you cared about how far you could get, but it's not so uh, damning that you can't just pick it up again. So Yeah, and yeah. I, yeah so I guess my, my bias toward storytelling and experiences probably shows there a little bit. Well, no, it just uh, defines you as a as an artistic thinker, sir. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're not just doing it for the money. This is really how you think and uh, it yeah, comes I across. Mean, I, like, like, I had I had real jobs before I did this. Like if I if the goal was to make money, like I could go get a job where I didn't have to freak out all the time over whether what I was doing was really, you know, the best thing for the project or whatever. Like they're definitely sure less intensity occupations that would still pay the bills but um. oh yeah yeah i've uh the show so far has mostly been developers who are around as uh they're kind of in the same field as you in terms of they've mm. started up and done their own thing but they've worked in in the industry in the past and none of them are confident that they're going to survive per se yeah and the, th the important thing is just to not worry about it there's no way i can know whether or not i'm gonna like get to continue to do this yeah. but i know that so like i'm sort of it i don't know it's sort yeah. of like like if i was more zen i would be at peace with my own mortality the same way i am at peace with <laughs> surviving in this particular career but sure. well, yeah. it's definitely a step in that direction and you're right the worry doesn't get you anywhere all that energy mm -hmm. spent worrying about starving could have been spent uh making a game or something yeah yeah i like a little pressure I like to stay, there's this, my friend calls it staying hungry. Oh yeah, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, <laughs> Alec Fields, that's an excellent movie. <laughs> uh, Sorry about my brain. Uh, but yeah, just like having, having like a little bit of pressure. Like, cause I, I don't know, does, it, does, any, does everybody have this dream where it's like, I'm just gonna work really hard, I'm gonna like, uh, I'm gonna meet the right people, I'm gonna take up, I'm gonna pick up the right freelance gigs, and I'm gonna retire by the time I'm 30. I'm just gonna make like so much money. I'm not gonna sleep for five years, but I'm just gonna make piles of money. And <laughs> maybe I not. don't think maybe everyone not. has that dream. I wish they did. I'm glad you do. Oh, uh, I don't anymore is the thing. Like, I would be miserable. Like, we, because I've had these, 
very brief periods of financial comfort when something that I make happens to resonate with the audience in a, in a good way. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm super unproductive. I get depressed. It's oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, something I was talking to about a hip hop, a hip hop producer on Twitter was telling me that the definition of success is being rich and famous. And I told them that most of the rich and famous people I know lose their direction. They're like, now what? I'm, I'm 50. Yeah. I mean, it'd be great to have like, like 50 cars or something like that would be cool, but uh, it can be, um, uh, there's this idea, there's this sort of idea of the paralysis of choice. If you have too many things to choose from, you just kind of can't pick. So you don't pick anything. Right, and, right, right. Um, running out of money is a really good way to go, oh crap, I need to pick something <laughs> because otherwise no food. Um, huh. Again, that, that fits perfectly with your uh, a lot of the design decisions. You don't give people a lot of different ways to choose, but you force them to make a lot of choices. Yeah, the... you want you want there's this there's a sweet spot and there's an actual like there's actual psychological science behind how big that sweet spot is and how it works. Um, huh. they, they, like they do all these like weird lab trials on humans where um, they would give you like say it was like chocolates like little fancy chocolates and they would give people a tray of 30 chocolates and they okay. would like eventually pick one and then some, they would give another person like a handful of chocolates, just like five chocolates to pick from. And then they would give another person, um, uh, you know, they would just give them a chocolate and then you would rate like how satisfied you were, like how good you thought the chocolate tasted. Mm -hmm. And it would be different, even though it was the exact same chocolate the person who got to pick from three or four thought theirs was the best. The person who didn't get a choice was really disappointed. Okay. And the person who had to pick from 20 or 30 things was, you know, right in the middle. Right. Less satisfied than the people who yeah. could really identify how they made yeah. their choice. Whereas 20, well, you A can't... lot of the time you want to funnel, like if you're trying to reach a really large audience, that's a really, I think it's a really important thing to keep in mind. If you're making okay. Dwarf Fortress, it's much less important to keep in mind. Ah, okay. You, know, you give people 50 kinds of dwarves and like, because that's where the magic is. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Pokemon, there's a lot of different yeah. Pokemon to choose from. <laughs> we'll get started on Pokemon. That could be a, a problem for the show. I just yeah, yeah, if there's only five Pokemons total, then like, where does that leave you? Yeah, yeah, I wonder. Well, that's, <laughs> <laughs> where does that leave you? I actually was gonna, uh, ask you what do you think of my new game idea what do i what what do you think of my new game i'm gonna pitch a game idea to you oh, okay to bring it, it on i figured out that the reason i like pokemon so much and i have actually caught them all i can grab my 3ds and show you oh, yeah. caught all. i caught like six <laughs> i have all 646 currently released pokemon and i realized the reason i catch them isn't because uh I uh, care that much about the game itself, but each one is like a little piece of fine art to me. So I love the way they're designed. And it's, yeah, uh, yeah. I, went to, I went to art school, so I used to think about making art and buying art and being in that scene. Uh, it never really panned out. But it, to me, it's just like virtual art collecting. So how would that be for a game where you go out in the wild and you bump into like a Picasso and you have to like beat it down <laughs> with money until you can capture it and add it to your collection. Pokemon for, for art collectors. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, I kind of feel like there's a, there's an audience for anything and especially something like something that is admittedly super niche, like a virtual fine art collector simulator. Yeah. Um, Turn-based like, battle. <laughs> when you get down to that small an audience, they're like the most passionate people in the world. Like there's got to be somebody else out there who's like, oh my God, they finally made it. Like my dream game. You know, like, and, uh, huh. like the guy, like the, like the audience for like Microsoft train simulator. Right. They love to Steam and they're, it's like, it's like $40,000 or something to get like the train simulator and the train simulator expansion packs. But right. like there are hobby games for people. And I think that's like, that's a really powerful thing that, um, you know, I think Pokemon is a hobby game for people. A lot of competitive games are kind of hobby games. Mm -hmm. There's like a lot of people who like they don't play video games, but they play StarCraft. Right, right, right. Or they don't really play. They don't really play, you know, computer games, but they do play. They do play Counter Strike on the weekends. 
Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So if I did a Kickstarter for my art collector turn-based uh, strategy game, 10 people would want it, but they might be the people who are passionate enough about it to each give me a thousand bucks so I could make it. Uh, I think so, yeah. It's very yeah. optimistic of you. <laughs> I'm an optimistic guy. <laughs> um, but I mean, like, it's all like, this is, this is stuff that I've been thinking about um, a lot. And this was part of like the post cannibal malaise and something that um, I almost, I'm almost like, okay, I'm ready. Bring, give me more money and financial comfort now because um, so, something that is, I don't know, this, this is going to sound super uppity, but I think it's important to have a philosophy of art and craft. Like you if do. you're a person who makes something, I think you should have a theory or an idea about why you make that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't have to be super like, uh, you know, these are the, these are the bullet points of this, you know, medium that give me pleasure. Like it doesn't have to be like a very, like a dissection based understanding, but um, uh, like the way I look at things now is um, there's, there's kind of a spectrum of things that I could make. And on one end there's art and on the other end there's craft. And craft is going to be something that appeals to a wide audience. Um, and it's something that really adds a lot of value to their lives and it's meaningful to them. And so maybe they're willing to part with money for that experience in a, in a way that would be meaningful because the audience would be big enough that that could support me. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's what I would call art. Okay. Um, and this isn't like terms that anybody else should use. These are just like my internal organization. Sure. Oh, this is really interesting. Um, but on the art end of the spectrum would be something like Capsule, which I did for Venus Patrol, which okay. was, uh, it's, it's a game where there's not even like a player character. It has no instructions. It has no tutorial. It's kind of, a, it pretends to be a radar terminal. And so it pretends that you are the person in the game sitting in your chair and it tells you nothing and it's dark and it's weird and it's creepy and i know that there's a small a smaller audience for that than there is for something like cannibal um right, you know, right. my mom's not going to oh. sit down and play this game and go yeah i'm totally into hard science fiction minimalist radar based zero person survival horror claustrophobia simulations like, you know like just not that many people are interested in that you know i want to make it i want to make sure the game sure. is accessible to everyone who is interested in that but there are these like niche interests. Right. And I think as long as you understand what that is when you go into the project and you're doing it on purpose and you go like, this, is, mm -hmm. this isn't a mass, this isn't something that's gonna appeal to a large group of people. So maybe it's gonna be you know, non-commercial. I'm not gonna expect to make a ton of money from this project. And um, to me, that's a big deal because like if, if you don't know what you're making, sometimes that's okay. But if it's a longer term project, it, that's something that helps me a lot to make make decisions about what to put in it. So if you're going to make a hardcore strategy game about fine art resource management, mm -hmm. um, something that you probably wouldn't have to do is worry about whether or not it can compete with Angry Birds. <laughs> probably not. The visual polish, right? right. So like, right. but that's a really important thing as a designer because otherwise you're going to go down this rabbit hole where you're like iterating endlessly on like the shape of the buy button which is something that's really really important if there are 50 million players for your game but if there's only like you know a few thousand people which is a, enough of an audience to support like a hobby project by mm -hmm. far um you know it, this as long as the buy button is visible and you can click it pretty much you're okay huh Huh, so it, see, for, for me, it's not as practical. For you, you have to think about art and craft in a way that's going to depend on whether you pay the rent or not. I, I think about it just because it's, it's fun. Well, and part and, of it's just to take uncertainty out of, like, if anytime you run a small company, anytime you have to be the person who, you know, makes the call, like, yes, the game is going to look like this, or the game is going to, you know, we're, we need to change the mechanics to feel more like this. There's a lot of uncertainty in that. Aside from like blasting out a beta test to hundreds of people and getting feedback and trying to parse the feedback or putting pe like wiring people up clockwork orange style and like measuring their eyeballs, you know. Sure, there's no way to know. Yeah. 
unless you do that. Yeah, for, I mean, for practical purposes, you do end up with a lot of situations where you're essentially doing intuitive design. You're designing the way you think it should work based on kind of your personal opinion. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that's to me where the art comes in the way yeah, i design it's a blast. Oh. like well that's why we do this right it's like i i i want the game to work like this but right. for me and it that's... helps a lot to have this extra level of like i think it should work like this because these are the people that i think are going to enjoy the game mm -hmm. and you know if i put myself in their shoes uh, is this something that they're going to get or is this something that's going to distract them from the stuff that they like? Um, those are just extra useful design filters when a lot of the time you kind of don't have any design filters because you're just making up whatever you want. Right, you're just being yourself and putting yourself out there, but you have to uh, balance that with being considerate to the uh, to the audience. Yeah. So and similar you know, when you write... Right? I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Like, and the cool thing is, like, if you know that your audience is only the thousand other people on Earth who have your particular deep niche interest, then like, make that decision ahead of time, and then you know that's your guide. But if you do think you found something that, like, not that like, oh, this is a good mainstream sellout idea, but whoa, like, this could resonate and affect a really wide audience. So now I have to, I have to keep that in mind when I'm crafting, you know the first five seconds that someone spends with the game, the first 10 seconds that someone spends with the game suddenly are a really big deal. Um, right. Because they don't have the endless patience and faith in you as a designer that your tiny, you know, passionate audience has. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I guess, I don't know, people don't seem to talk about that much, but it's something like, um, you know, you know, English country tune? English country tune? Yeah. No. It's a cool, oh, it's an amazing puzzle game that came out this year by Stephen Lavelle, who goes by okay. Inkle Pare uh, on the Twitter and stuff. But okay. uh, uh, it's a fantastic puzzle game, but there's a lot of parts in the game where he doesn't give you instructions, he doesn't tell you how to do anything. And it's a simple game, but there's a lot of really weird counterintuitive aspects to solving the puzzles in it. And for me, like getting through that game was basically going like, I trust Stephen. Like, he's not just pulling my leg. Like, this puzzle has a point. It's here for a reason. And I think for a lot of people, that's going to, I think, I may be wrong, but that might be sort of how people relate to the witness when, mm. when that's ready and kind of goes out the door, where people are going to go, man, this is confusing. But John knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to give him, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to keep plugging away at this because I think I'm going to have a cool epiphany. Um, well, I haven't played The Witness yet, but I'm hoping that it keeps itself enjoyable the way Braid did, yeah, regardless yeah. of whether you know why you're doing it. Uh, yeah. That's what I hope from him, because, you know, he's a big name in our circles, but... For sure. It would be great if he could, like you're saying, do, craft the game in such a way that it doesn't make new players who don't have that level of investment work yeah. yet. Yeah, yeah. And from what I've read, he might have pulled it off. I hope so. I think so. He's a pretty bright guy. <laughs> he is. He is a pretty bright guy. Uh, so I'm hopeful about that. But I was going to say before that to me, art and craft is the difference between art is like making out with a girl without even like thinking about it. Like your, your <laughs> brain isn't even on. You're just like, oh, I'm into it. Yeah, I'm in. And craft is like cycling in your head like, well, I read in the book about how to make out with girls that you're supposed to do exactly three rotations with the, with the mouth. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, ho hopefully when those two like come that? to... What, say that again? Do they have books like that? <laughs> I think they have books like that. Either that or I just dreamt it up when I read it. <laughs> but, um, but combining those two, if you're going to have to make out with you know 10,000 strangers in a row probably using a little bit of your passion for the art and using what you think you know works in general for, for other human beings, putting those yeah, together. Yeah, I mean, I think you want to, um, the temptation to, you could, I, I would think of it almost in a, in a way like, um, it, it sort of affects the, the amount of risk that you can take. Right, right, because um, art is where the risk often is. Yeah, and I think and I think it's not that big a deal. I think if you think about who your audience is and and you think about what is the core of the thing I want to make and can that relate? What size audience do I think that can relate to? And you might get it wrong, 
but you can use that to adjust to that kind of, you know, the kind of risk that you might be expecting or something like that. But sure. um, I think, uh, you know, like in any other, any other art form, like if you make a movie that takes a lot of risks, it deviates a lot from the core things that people love, sometimes that's going to be a big hit. Like, I don't think anybody really anticipated Lord of the Rings being this, like, juggernaut because it's kind of a niche interest in a lot of ways sure uh, it's well known but, happen, but i didn't i didn't expect cannibal to become some kind of crazy juggernaut that actually resonated with people either because i put a lot of nerdy stuff in there there's a lot of like half-life 2 dna in there there's a lot of like very specific retro video game stuff there's this kind of uh parkour thing which is you know is still not mainstream at all like my parents wouldn't know what parkour is so i sort of know that's like uh free freestyle walking right kind of yeah it's it's like a, a philosophically it's about the shortest distance between two points may include going over things oh okay um it's sort of a, a uh, ostensibly a, a philosophy of freedom of movement and a a, a sort of pleasant disregard for uh, conventional locomotion, especially in urban areas. Huh. I, oh, I had no idea it was that detailed. I thought it was guys just jumping on things and falling down. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot of that. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's a whole Zen thing. Like a lot of it is like, whoa, backflips are rad. But <laughs> um, there is something like a little bit lower down in it too, which is kind of cool. But, but you know, like, like I said, like those are not, that's not a, like a mainstream piece of knowledge or anything, but that's stuff that I think is cool and that I put into the thing. And it, it was the right thing at the right time and it went, you know, it went bananas. But, well, I like to think that mainstream is eventually created by people who put a genuine idea out there. And oftentimes people gauge whether an idea is genuine by if it's just following the script for profit or whether it's something that someone would only do if they really meant it. Like when rap music got started mm -hmm. in the seventies, there was no like, Oh, everyone loves rap music. This is going to get us rich. They really did it because they took the tools they had and tried to express themselves genuinely. Yeah. And that can blow up if it's like you said, at the right place in the right time. And, and Cannonball, mm -hmm. I, I saw as a, an example of that, you weren't following the script for, for profit with Cannonball, you know? No, semi, no, it was, there, was, like, there was money had nothing to do with it. You know, it was like, oh crap, I only have one weekend to make a thing. Well, it better be awesome. I didn't know you made it that fast. And it's on Android now and PSN and uh, it's on the Android uh, Humble Indie Bundle, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's uh, that was ported by some guys um, just a few hours from where I live, actually. Um, their company's called Kit Kitty Face Software. Oh yeah, um, but, but yeah, and they they were they were awesome because they were like, hey, we think Cannonball's really cool. What do you think if we went through and made three D versions of everything? Uh, like, would that be awesome? And I was like, yeah, that would be so <laughs> yeah. rad. Is there any chance that could come to uh, like the three DS or something if it's already in three D? Um, maybe. I mean, we're we're talking about things. There's there's something that's kind of tricky is now, even though. You know, the game doesn't have to be super retro pixel art, um, which I still think looks cool. Um, there's still kind of like a, it's a, it's a small game. Like, even though I'm super happy with it, I don't say that in a pejorative way, but I think people have expectations on other platforms. Sure, you know, sure, sure. You download yeah. an XBLA game, like that, you, that comes with expectations of having, you know, different play modes and, um, you know, a little more, uh, maybe a little more systemic depth than mm -hmm. what is there in one form or another. Uh, that makes so sense. That's well, what as a consumer, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, as a consumer, I would get a lot of value out of maybe Gravity Hook, Cannonball, if Cannonball had the two player option, mm -hmm. $4.99 maybe with 3D effects added, but not much more than that. If that were a 3DS eShop game, I would. I would buy that in a second. Yeah, well, the, thing that I was, the thing that I'm fiddling around with in my head now is this the stuff that I had up on Twitter earlier this week where it's like, what can we do? Because we don't want to mess up the Cannonball recipe. Like the recipe mm. is just fine. I don't want to start adding tons of stuff or add like levels, you know, like, oh, you beat level two. Now there's a boss fight. Like what? I don't even know 
what that would constitute. Um, yeah, that would be a different game then. You wouldn't even call it Cannonball then. Yeah, but but there are there are ways to explore what's there, and it still would really be Cannonball. And uh, those are the things that I'm thinking about now to try and just give it a little more, um, make it more in line with what people expect from. Mm. Uh, you know, from a 3DS game or a PC game or something like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, if I can help you with that, let me know. I've got plenty of great ideas like that art collector one. <laughs> well, yeah, making fun of myself. There's a question we have from one of our uh, readers Ooh. slash listeners. He wants to know what it was like working with Danny B and how much input did you say on his music? And or did he just do his own thing? We just had Danny B on our other oh yeah pod, yeah podcast last week. He's a great guy. Which uh, which game specifically? Just in general, are they asking? I'm assuming he means Cannibal Gravity Hook. Uh, oh. Which other ones did he work on with you? Um, he did the music for Fathom, Steambirds, uh, Hunger Games. Oh yeah, yeah. We've done a bunch of stuff, but I mean, but generally, um, I don't I don't give him a lot of direction. Um, I sometimes have to prod them a little bit, especially if um, if I'm asking for music at the last minute, which I frequently do. Um, sure. Occasionally, I'll get something that to me sounds maybe more like one of the other games that Danny is doing at the time. Because he's always working on like five games at once, yeah. not enough like our little slice of thing. But it's um, that's even that's rare. Like like for the Hunger Games, I remember there was a specific phone call where. Um, the movie studio was like, hey, so, you know, what's the direction you're giving for the composer? And, you know, what's the samples you sent him? And what are you asking him for? And I was like, I didn't send him anything. It's Danny. Like, I just said, you know, make something cool. And here's some, here's some references, you know, so you can get, you know, situated in, in what the game is. Because we had to write the music before the game was done. Uh, and, yeah, the first pass at music that he delivered, the movie studio was like, Oh my God! This is amazing! Like emails oh. in all capital letters with exclamation points at the end. So oh, that's great! That's great! Yeah. I really want him and you and everyone I like to just be totally successful and never have to worry again. But not <laughs> so much that you don't worry in a way that's productive for you. Uh, here's another question uh, from Asif Ratkrat. He asks questions like every week, and I pronounce it wrong every time. So. <laughs> uh, any chances of a port of Hunger Games to Android done by you or someone else? Also, is there any other book, movie, show you would like to adapt? So we'll take those in order. Oh man, double, double, double hitter. Uh, mm. There, there's definitely a chance it'll come to Android. I know, I don't know any of the details. Um, the last time we talked about it was a couple of months ago, and it couldn't happen in parallel to the game development itself. Um, right. Things were too crazy. So you know, a port has been talked about, but not recently, and that's kind of all I know. Uh, okay, so it's possible and it's on the plate, but you don't have. Yeah, this. it's definitely talked about, and the audience is there, and it's a, it's a free game. So, like, if we were making a paid title, I think I would have some sort of natural and justified reservations about mm -hmm. um, putting a ton of effort into um, getting it up on on Android. But it's it's a free game, and it's kind of like, why not? Sure, uh, sure. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, so, yeah, is there we'll any other? Kind of a, it's up to the studio, really. Um, so because they're the one who has to pay for you to put out something that what they get out of it I suppose is mostly promotion and just uh, yeah they get visibility and I think I, I like to imagine at least that they get some sort of credibility or something oh yeah. yeah good point making I hadn't thought of it it making, definitely uh, making, like when was the last time there was an ad genuine movie tie-in game that people liked at all movie tie-in yeah uh, Jaws on the NES. I love that game. The NES was the golden age of tie-in games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of them were released late. Like the thing that came the closest is Batman for NES. Uh, so oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Batman game, which is really solid, but it definitely takes supreme liberties with the uh, with the Tim Burton film. Oh yeah. sure. Did you did you but play yeah, the Jaws like... game on the NES? Hmm. Did you play the Jaws game? Oh on yeah. The... Oh yeah. Where you play Brody's wife, who's just like killing jellyfish yeah yeah totally but like Should there's a bunch of stuff like that that came out really that was because that came out like five or ten years after the film right it came out right around jaws 4 the revenge starring mario van peoples and michael kane 
Oh, so maybe it was a movie tie-in. But... It was, but they were so embarrassed because the movie was so bad that they didn't do much to promote that. They yeah, just, like, wanted yeah. To... that was probably the right idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that game, though. Way better than the movie. Um, are there any other book movie uh, show tie-ins oh. that you would want to do? Oh, man. Um... Yeah, there profoundly is. I don't know what I would even do. I love, um, like, something I read around the same time was um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like would be, uh, even if you did a version that was a little bit tamer as, like, um, some sort of insane, like, L.A. Noir text adventure with like an uplink hacking mini game or something like. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, man. It could be. It could be so cool. It's um. But I like. I really like anything that even comes close to, like that classic '70s conspiracy thriller vibe. Like mm -hmm. the. I, I haven't seen any of the film adaptations, but the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo books, um, have this kind of like sensational like sexual violence vibe. But the books themselves are just Chinatown, um, Three Days of the Condor, uh, Marathon Man. They're just like sure. hardcore classic conspiracy movies. And I don't think that crops up in games enough. Like that's a really, it's, the, it's a perfectly vague plot that would be so well suited to the kinds of gameplay that I like, which mm. tends to be running away from stuff. Um, sure. Uh, Metal Gear did it pretty well, I think. That had a creepy sort of... Yeah, yeah. We think we are. They, they, did, they did cool, subtle things, too. Like, um, uh, like for me, Metal Gear was ruined as soon as you could actually aim well. Oh, yeah. I know there was probably... Because there wasn't a technical limitation to that, I don't think, on the PS1. Because they had first-person camera on the PS1. Mm -hmm. You could look down hallways and stuff, but they didn't let you shoot that way. They forced right. you to shoot from the top down. Which is like impossible. You can't. You can see like five feet. So they kind of. I to me, that's almost like an intentional authorial decision to be like, we're giving you a gun, but don't use it. Like, do the running around sneaky stuff, please. Right. And backed right. off that in later titles, and you could argue that that was, you know, a good or a bad decision. But for me, it just made it way less interesting. I I, I see what you mean. I, I felt the same way when they added auto aim to Resident Evil. It yeah. was like I no longer was afraid by the fact that the zombie was off camera and I had to like move right, to right. a position where I could see it. I just press auto aim and shoot, and eventually, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, with the yeah. I think I think Girl with the Dragon Tattoo would be cool. I think um, there's some really classic sci-fi that is just like awesome raw material for game stuff, um, like Logan's Run. Beware, and stuff. Beware, Max Headroom. <laughs> That's uh, Sinistar, our, our co-host, who rarely... Oh, gotcha, shows. gotcha. Well, there's, He's like, got... like Ender's, Ender's Game um, oh, yeah. uh, actually has a game in it, and you could build, like... I really like the idea of doing, like, weird, like, meta things where, like, the Ender's Game game wouldn't be a third-person action game where you play as Ender. It would be we just build the simulator and have, like, networked pilots working together and like come up with a new plot twist to reveal after a few weeks of running it or something. Huh. Like, those are things that I think would be really cool. Man, I, I hope they give you the money to make the thing soon. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, hopefully this is a good start. I, I was really relieved just as a, a fan of video games in general to see a movie studio actually respecting an artist yeah. and keeping them out yeah. to give them money for... I hope that I becomes. Even, like, I don't even care if I get to do another one, but I definitely am looking forward to. There's so many people who are, um, you know, better than me at doing this stuff. That you know, maybe next year they could get like a weird short contract to, you know, do, um, you know, look at a film or a book through the lens of video games in a really cool way. I hope so. I'm, I hope I'm so. super. I'm. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm, I, I think that's actually going to happen, but I really hope it does. It would be so <laughs> cool. Well, I think a lot of it will depend on how successful the Hunger Games movie is. So, so, so far, so good. It's pretty good so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people, people are talking about it. And you can take all the credit for that. Say, so, oh yeah, that all app I did. Pretty much all of it. I, I, was, I was instrumental, uh, I would say. Who's to say you weren't? I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Every, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> We're all getting... <laughs> Nah, don't listen to them. We've got all these good questions coming in, but 
Jeez, oh man, yeah. I can do, I can do the shorter answers. answers. Oh no, you're doing beautifully. Thank you so much for for being such an eloquent and well spoken guest. Eloquent oh. does mean well spoken. Sorry to be redundant. Anyway, um, I gotta throw out my idea about the Hunger Games real quick before we go. I'll time yeah. myself on this. Two minutes. The reason I think the Hunger Games is resonating so much with this particular generation of people is because this is the first generation of people uh, that, uh, you know, let's say 10 to 15 year olds, they've grown up with online first person shooters as kind of the cultural keystone of their, um, and, and the way they uh, get involved yeah. with technology. Call of Duty is bigger than anything the video game industry has ever seen. And yeah. Call of Duty is, a game that everyone knows is rated mature, so all the 10-year-olds that play it feel like they're grown up playing it. And what it teaches them about being grown up is you are interacting with your peers, but they weren't chosen. It's just randomly assigned peers in mm -hmm. your world. And you talk to them, and you try to kill them in an arena. Yep. Which is the Hunger Games! <laughs> yeah. Holy smack! Yeah. What do you think of my theory? <laughs> Any good? It's It's pretty good. I mean, I think that's legit. I was talking to... Zach Gage went and visited um, his friend's son or his nephew or something. I went into, I think, to talk to a like a middle school class or high school class, and that was the entire social structure of the boys in the class was mm -hmm. just modern warfare. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I see it all the time. I've got friends with eight-year-old nephews, ten-year-old nephews. They go to the mall. They're like, "Oh, Kirby! Oh, Pokemon! Oh, Call of Duty! Oh, I love that one with the killing!" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's totally normal to them, and we've got this culture where the kids want to be grown up, and we also want to treat kids like adults for whatever reason. We've got this fetishizing of teenage girls and whatnot, so yeah. we're causing our kids to grow up way too quick. And their their mentality is to grow up by being mature, and maturity is often ranked yeah. by um by Call yeah. of Duty and uh, Hunger Games. That's really just a coming of age story too, right? It's about being uh, uh yeah i mean it's like a like from the get-go there's just like there's like a series of like tiers of responsibility for the main character so she's the one who provides for her family and then you start to understand that she actually um not only does she provide for her family but she's kind of crucial to like the some of like the poverty stricken ecosystem in the town where she lives and then you find out oh she's kind of um crucial to her district when she goes off to the games and then as the story continues she ends up kind of becoming um not quite a martyr but like a symbol of a rebellion almost and there's just this kind of like like cascading levels of responsibility to larger and larger groups of people and um, yeah, and, yeah, and coping with that and like as as a recent parent like that's a thing that resonates with me a lot is like oh crap i like this is the first time I've played Street Fighter online in like four or five months. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're I really have responsibilities that not only do I have to do them, but I prefer them. Right, that's the thing. You get to that point where you truly aren't the person you used to be, and work is actually what you care about. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I should get to these questions before these men. Let's get do it. Them. Let's do it. Let's rapid yeah, fire. We have a little time. We've got twelve minutes, so. Real quick, uh, Vladimir Zhao wants to know, where does the atomic come from in your, your nickname? Your oh, man. Um, let's do the short version. It was uh, it's from high school, and I like how it sounds. <laughs> That's how I got my nickname, too, which is Two-Tone Brown. <laughs> no one calls me that anymore. There was a time. When uh, I was called that by a, a, a beautiful and I, and I was not given this nickname. I made it up for myself. I feel like that's... Very few thing. people can pull that off. I've tried that for years. And well, I didn't use it publicly in high school. That, that probably wouldn't have flown. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but once you're out there... That's true. Rappers can just come up with their name. Like, I am LL Cool J. Ladies love me, and I'm cool. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it would have been okay. I just I was too chicken to try it, but... I don't think it would. I think your instincts were true on that. I think uh, so. People, they reject when you name yourself, unless you're a video game developer or a or a rapper. So congratulations, yeah. you did it. Well, and we're like our, all the indies. We're all we all met. Everybody I know in the community, I met. Um, I met online. 
Mm -hmm. So everybody has some goofy fake name that they used on the internet forum where we met. So it's not it's not quite as, as bizarre. Sure, it's kind of the norm. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, Limofo Limiofo wants to know what he spells what W H. What was your inspiration for the game Press Any Key? Oh, um, oh boy. <laughs> I don't know if there's a short answer for that one. Um, that was a uh, test. So uh, Will Wright has talked about this before. Hang on, I'm going to close my window. That dog's annoying. Is that your dog? No, that's my neighbor's dog. Oh, my dogs can... are sleeping. That's all they do. Um, oh, that's nice. Uh, so uh, Will Wright's talked about this problem that people have, and Radio Labs talked about it, and other, other people have talked about it, and people don't understand big numbers very well. Hmm. Um, like, uh, and this is like an actual biological problem to some extent, like, uh, like anybody who doesn't learn like, a, uh, like a number based counting system, like we have a base 10 counting system. If you never learn that, um, mm -hmm. most like, um, primitive groups or whatever, they count by there's like one, two, three, several, and a lot. Huh? It's like logarithmic. There's like five categories of number. Um, but I okay. think that scales up even when we can, like, because we have to actually learn to count in this other way. If you don't teach someone to count, that's how they'll count. Okay. Um, One, two, so, three, several, and a lot. Okay. Yeah, basically. And then so we, we can learn. Um, and that, that actually correlates with, like, our happiness in the number of choices we get and so on. But um, uh, if you do learn to count, uh, like everyone does, basically, um, mm -hmm. I think once there's enough zeros, things just lose meaning. Hmm. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, talks about this too. And it's just, it's really, really hard. And so when somebody makes a thing that helps you understand a large number, that to me has always been really cool. Like there was a, there was a flash thing going around recently where you could scroll in and out from like the size of an atom to the size of the universe. Oh, wow. Like dynamically scroll through all of that stuff in and out and you would see like, wow. So like, you know, that's, uh, you know, you'd start tiny, you go from atoms to insects, to people, to planets, to galaxies, to universes. And you would just, and it, you still didn't understand it perfectly, but you, it started to give you some grasp of, uh, of the scale and size of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wasn't really like, feel it and conceive of it as opposed to- Yeah, it yeah, and that's, that's kind of what Spore was supposed to be about a little bit. You know, Spore had those same kind of levels of, you know, uh, single-celled organisms up to um, small animals, up to cities, up to planets, up to outer space, up to galaxies. Um, sure. And it's, it's one of these things where it's like, if people were better at this, then like the world would actually be different. Mm -hmm. So I like, to, I like to do little experiments to try and get people to understand like the difference in size between things and especially um, press any key is specifically if people don't know it it's um, it's a very very simple quote unquote game where um, you press keys on the keyboard and it begins to tell you a story and it begins to um, and little red pixels fill the screen one pixel for each button press so you just kind of like eventually people, most people seem to like mash the keyboard and these red dots come up and the text kind of unfolds and starts telling you about, you know, um, this is another way maybe that we can start to explain the idea of large numbers to people is by basically giving you carpal tunnel for having to tap a number, like tap a button to make the next number. Huh. So like tap relentlessly for three or four minutes, you still only make, you still only press keys a couple of thousand times. Mm -hmm, and your mm -hmm. wrists are already sore. And so you start to tell people like, now imagine a number that's 10 times bigger than that or a hundred times bigger than that. Like, you know, imagine you were doing this, typing as fast as you could for a whole day. Like mm -hmm. how many numbers would that be? And then right. there's kind of a little bit of a sucker punch which people can enjoy or not, which is um, if you fill the entire screen with pixels, that's the number of um, civilians that have died since the US invaded Iraq about a decade ago. Wow. Uh, and most people have to physically stop typing before they get even like 10% through the body count. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which I hope the idea was maybe that would illustrate to some people that would be like a, you know, the problem is it, it, it's going to mainly preach to the choir, right? Like that's well, not going to. Well, yeah, I guess that's happen. the people who would seek that game out. But if they spread it around. Um, yeah. Well, it was mainly just like a test. Like, is that effective? Is like, 
because that's something games can be. Games, video games can be work, and is mm-hmm. work an effective way of communicating scale in a way? Because it's something we don't like. You know, right, not, right. You know, if the game is really, really fun, ten hours will blow by in a minute. But sure, if it's not sure. that fun, it's going to be. It's the the seconds that you spend with it kind of start to stand out. I guess. That yeah. said, I think that. Um, People are acutely aware, especially video game fans, of any little annoyance that they have in a game. Like any, Absolutely. it's often the princess and the pea sort of thing that they love this game, but this one little thing didn't fit, and it yeah, for some yeah, reason yeah. it's intense to them. So if you were to make them feel the pain uh, of hitting those buttons, but get them to keep playing it to the point yeah. where each little that was the whole idea is use the the most basic primitive hook, which is. Uh... <laughs> A dog was outraged. Okay, that one was my dog. <laughs> um, yeah, so use use like the most primitive hook in the world to keep people playing, which is tell them a story. Mm-hmm. Um, but then make what they're playing be the worst part of playing anything. Then maybe that would be interesting. But, so it, that's so interesting that you would say the most primitive way to keep them playing is telling a story because there's so many people that say a game isn't sophisticated and ha- unless it has a story that's just actively being told to you. To me, that is quite primitive. I, I don't oh, get yeah, a lot yeah, out of it. That's all we had before. Like that was before, before people could write things down. Everything was story and like you lived in a story. Like there wasn't even like necessarily a real world that you were in. There was this, mm. there's this idea of, it's like old ideas of like permeability between like the real world and the spirit world and the spirit world is a story world. And that was how you lived before there was things like writing and stuff like oh, that. Man. You're um, blowing my mind. You ever <laughs> go to college and stuff? Everybody, everybody who's listening to this, go watch Cave of Forgotten Dreams on Netflix like right now. Okay. It's really good. I'll do it. How much we got? Well, oh, we got 175 seconds left um let's see ask this is from sleepy guy with two eyes do you think story should be told through cutscenes or purely through gameplay which uh goes along with what we were just talking about do you, do you feel cut like have no place in a game cutscenes right? have no place in a game no i mean if, if it's going to be there it needs to be there in a way that's really really considered and not just thrown in there you know like if you treat cutscene as theater you know mm. and you and you and you consider it as like this is is there a way for the theater to be playful for the audience? You know, then maybe it should be there, but nobody like, I mean, it's like a halftime show at the Super Bowl, right? Like it's, it's enjoyable to watch, but it's not really part of the game or anything. Well, people. And they, but they understand it. Like the, the Super Bowl halftime isn't about the game, right? The Super Bowl halftime is a separate piece of entertainment that just mm-hmm. happens. Sure. Uh, and it has its own appeal, but it's not part of the actual football game. Like the football game, think... people playing. I wish that people saw it the way you do. I think we'd have a very different industry if you did, but people have really convinced themselves that the reason they liked a game is because it had so many cutscenes and just told a story like a movie. Because we, I think in the video game culture, we have it ingrained in us that, oh, we're kind of like... The, the black sheep of the entertainment family and movies are really what's legitimate and we're just kind of eh. Whereas I think video games are much more legitimate and the more they take advantage of what video games can do that movies can't, the more interesting for sure. they are for me. Uh, but no, we've got legions of people out there that would, would claim the opposite and that... Well, I mean, they're, they're entertaining and there is there's this idea that there's some kind of like magic that gets unlocked and when you have story and gameplay and they align in just exactly the right way. And I love Metal Gear Solid. The original Metal Gear Solid is crammed with cutscenes. Sure. Um, and I I really like that game. But, but I don't... a lot of them are interactive. You can look around in the cutscene. You can kind of yep. make your own. If they yep. hadn't done that, I would have gotten bored, I think. And, but I'm also not convinced that the reason that I like Metal Gear Solid has anything to do with the fact that cutscenes exist in here. Mm, yeah right because that's the that's the opposing argument you'd have to make is like uh, like is there no other way to communicate what you're trying to do there and like the most effective cutscene in Metal Gear Solid I think happens about 10 minutes in you've just we've, been, only, we've only got 15 seconds oh, oh yeah. will you come back on the show someday this is yeah, so good yeah, you can go sure. all day you're amazing <laughs>
so glad we met. We never met before. We've got eight seconds. Anything you want to say to the world? Um, no, thanks for having me on, man. This is good. I love you, man. Bye. And that's, that's the end of the show, I think. Closing music is coming on. Oh, wait. I think I cut the... I, I said I love you too soon. That's something I've done a lot in my life. Uh, <laughs> with the girls, but now it's with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to see if Sinistar. Hey, Sinistar, we said. Fuck approaches me with another name to shame of tame lions. Not really bragging about a 